Tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce my dear friend and your dear friend, Herb Kagan. I love doing this twice a month. Herb is continuing to lead us through the 12 steps with a spiritual and emotional sobriety focus that will add important dimension to our recoveries. And uh, he's going tonight to explore step nine, that process of forgiveness. And he's going to He's going to tell you and me how to release, which I need to know. So, Herb, take it away. I can't wait to hear what you have to teach me today. Thank you so much, Susie. My name is Herb. <clears throat> I'm an alcoholic. My sobriety date is February 21st, 1984. I've been at this for a while. <clears throat> and it's really a pleasure a true pleasure to be here to address this international group. And to have it recorded, I'm actually using <clears throat> this recording as part of my weekly workshops that I began in July because it's so succinct um, trying to get the step process <clears throat> to be maximally effective. So we're rather than doing a one year process, we're doing a six month process, uh, which requires a lot more discipline and distillation of the information. <clears throat> so I really appreciate uh, Patrick and Susie's invitation to come and <clears throat> share and to be recorded. You can find these recordings, I'm sure, through, as Susie and Patrick had indicated, some mechanisms that they have but I also believe they're on my playlist uh, in the YouTube uh, channel. Um, my own personal editor uh, edits them and then puts them into uh, one of the playlists um, on the my YouTube channel. So step nine. Oh, before I get there, I guess um, the reason I've left that information up there is that, that the website that I uh, have, uh, herbk.com, has multiple resources for helping people navigate the 12 steps. The, my total ministry, and I call it that, my mission <clears throat> is to help people get on and to stay on a spiritual path. Susie mentioned <clears throat> about this rhythm of topics that Patrick and Susie have set up for this year between Alan and myself, Dr. Berger and myself. <clears throat> Those first nine steps is the program of recovery. Those first nine steps promise sobriety. I'm pausing. The first nine steps promise, in fact, guarantee freedom from addiction. I don't see any other interpretation for on page 84 <clears throat> when the big book and Bill writes, we are placed in a position of neutrality. I'm quoting. That's not a paraphrase. We are placed grace in a position of neutrality well but it's after the ninth step which means we've done a lot of work <clears throat> a lot of willingness to take direction and to take some action <clears throat> there's no time frame or timetable in the big book my personal experience is people can do the steps in three to six months if they have the time and good direction. And that most people finish within 18 to 24 months. That's my recommendation, not to delay it, but not to rush it artificially. I went through the steps four different times with four different men over a 20-year period. 
And so that time frame it represents my different experiences. The minimum was six months, the maximum was two years. Each time, very productive, very profound, and different. Each time. Broadening and deepening the experience. Step nine. It's good to hear it. It gives us a focus, the context. Steps one through three are to establish a relationship with power. Because we need freedom from our addiction. The whole point of coming to a 12-step program is to reduce and eliminate the suffering that we're experiencing. Those first three steps establish a relationship with power. The next set, I call it the second stage of the rocket launch, is to establish a relationship with ourself. The first step is, I need help. The second step is, help is available. The third step is, and I can access that help for the point of cleaning out the channel, me, my channel, of the fog, of the clouds, of the obstacles, <clears throat> of the impediments to my relationship with myself. But the third stage is to clean that channel, me, <clears throat> of the obstacles in me that have been created by me in terms of my dysfunctional relationship with others. I think the single point of the ninth step is justice. Lady justice with the blindfold and the scales to balance those scales, <clears throat> to establish a relationship with others in the 12 and 12, Bill talks about partnership. Having partnership with the balance of humanity, not just individual people, but the community of humanity <clears throat> made direct amends, made direct amends. It doesn't get real clear as to what that means, but I do believe it means face to face. Although he's a realist, Bill, when he writes the big book, to such people whenever possible, except to do so, would injure them or others. So as you read the material, pages 76 to 83 in the big book, it combines both steps eight and nine. Although they're very distinct steps. Step eight is naming the injured party whether that is a person or an institution. And step nine is actually taking the action to repair the damage. Made direct amends to such people wherever possible, wherever possible. He's very practical. Read the material, pages 76 to 83. And he shows some common sense application in personal experiences. Except when to do so would injure them or others. We can't get free at other people's expense. <clears throat> We're looking to establish or rehabilitate our relationship with others. Step nine uses the word amends. I have two connotations to that. Certainly it's to repair the damage that I've done. Real damage, physical, mental, emotional, financial, spiritual. Those are some of the categories that the 12 and 12 gives us. <clears throat> Please, Incorporate the 12 and 12 as part of your preparation for steps eight and nine. The 12 and 12 written 20, 25 years after Bill got sober, 1951, he 
published the 12 and 12. He got sober in 1934. Mm -hmm. He wrote the big book in 1939, so he had four years of experience when he wrote the big book, and that's a miracle in itself and a story for a different day. But in 1951, when he's 20, 25 years sober with lots of experience, he writes his commentary. There's not many instructions in the 12 and 12. There's a couple exceptions, step 11, maybe steps seven. Mm -hmm. But there's very few instructions in the 12 and 12, but there's lots of wonderful commentary and confirmation of the instructions in the big book by interpretation of amends, twofold. Repair them, but change me. Amend the constitution means to change the constitution. It would be mm, hypocritical of me to express regret to somebody if, in fact, I am continuing the behavior. Not that we have to become perfect before we make amends, then it'll never happen, but that we have a firm resolution to apply step six and seven so that we're in prayer attempting to change and in accountability to support us in the change. Those are my interpretations <clears throat> of step six and seven. If you haven't heard that, you might go to the Berlin recording. It will give you that interpretation, a little broader than what's in the big book or the 12 and 12, but it is my experience and it was very powerful. Making step six and seven the tool for change. <clears throat> And then to go to steps eight and nine to repair the damage to other people or institutions. I gave this four part dance again, not in the big book, not in the 12 and 12, but based on my experience and the directions that I got, I think it's worthwhile to just bring it back to our attention. If you were here and if you weren't here, this might be helpful to you. Describe the harm <clears throat> as you see it. Not in any detail to go through a autobiography or an inventory of any kind or a confession. No, that's not the point here. Very succinctly. I stole $10,000 from you. Uh, I'm, it's fictitious. That's not my experience, but it captures the essence of this description. But then you ask, is there anything else that I've done that you would like to talk about? I always add that because I'm not here to make them un unnecessarily uncomfortable. Everybody's uncomfortable, but unnecessarily uncomfortable. And I pause. Is there anything else that you would like to talk about that would describe the harm, the diminishment, the reduction in quality of life that I caused by being in your life. Pause and allow them to share something if they care to. Many times we were in a blackout or we're just so clueless that we were not considering the impact of our behavior on others. This will be especially true for family members. Although most people want it over with, even people who are in a 12-step program, even people who have experience with the amends process, most everybody's uncomfortable with this. It's so intimate. It's so personal. It's so confrontive. Then I suggest the amends that I plan on. I'm going to... I can't give you the $10,000 immediately, unless I can. And um, I'm going to, I would like to make payments of $100 a month or $25 a month or $10 a week or whatever your ability is to make the amend, the restitution. <clears throat> but 
but then I ask, is there is that okay, or is there anything else that needs to be addressed? So, for instance, they might say, well, that was 20 years ago. I would like compound interest on the money because I had a, not only the loss of the money, but the loss of the use of the money. And that would be legitimate. I've given lots of examples in the past recording, so you can revisit that for some specificity. <laughs> but this is setting us up to get free. This is setting us up to forgive them and to be forgiven. When I looked up the word forgive in the dictionary, look at my hand. It said a decision to release them, a decision to release them. How free do you want to be? That's the eighth step about willingness to make amends, to take the action. And forgiveness is a process, a decision to release them. And we know that there's a paradox there because we prayed the Lord's Prayer and we prayed the St. Francis Prayer. And both of them, 2,000 years apart in their writings, have the same dynamic. When we forgive them, we are forgiven. When we release them from their debts, our debts are released. Different cultures, different time frames, because the dynamic is absolutely the same. The next time we get together, I'll be discussing Fred Luskin's book on forgiveness. He's not in a 12-step program, and quite frankly, he's not spiritual in the sense of the traditional uh, definitions. He's immensely spiritual as a psychologist and as a scientist in the sense that he's a just a really decent human being, and he understands human nature, and he's written about the forgiveness process. The magic of his work, from my standpoint, is it's a total confirmation of our work. He comes, he's a professor at Stanford University. He did his doctoral dissertation for to become a clinical psychologist on forgiveness 30 years ago. And then he wrote a book to capture the essence of that process for lay people, not scientists, like lay people like us. He was asked to be on a panel, as I was, to talk about forgiveness. He was asked to talk about it from a scientific, psychological standpoint. I was asked to talk about it from a spiritual 12-step standpoint. Mm -hmm. I read his book in advance of that, and I found that it's a wonderful confirmation. Different vocabulary, slightly different rhythm to the process, but underneath the underneath the underneath. The dynamic is absolutely the same. Which is just a wonderful confirmation that science has confirmed what we have experienced from a spiritual standpoint. Because it's about human behavior and it's about human freedom. So this week I'll talk a little bit about forgiveness from my experience standpoint in the 12th step. And next week, I'll talk a little bit about it from Fred Luskin's standpoint. Mm -hmm. You could go to my way of life document in that's contained in the website in my uh, workshop material. Go to the homepage, herbk.com, go to the workshops. And at the bottom of the page on the workshops are a set of resources, one of which is called the Way of Life document. In that document, there's a three-page meditation, pages 38 to 40, that captures the spirit in more full description than the summary that I'm going to give you today. A uh, process of forgiveness, of, re of releasing them and of being released. What I discovered was in my review and study and collateral material from psychology and religious traditions, as well as philosophy, etc., the history of people's consciousness as to the forgiveness process. It is not to condone or forget. 
or tolerate or ignore or approve or excuse or minimize or pardon or deny or absolve or reconcile. Please hear that. Forgiveness doesn't mean you reconcile. You may not want to have a relationship with that person. You may not want to reconcile with your own family, with a father or a mother or siblings or even children. You may not want to for lots of various healthy reasons. Forgiveness doesn't include reconciliation or a surrender of justice. What does that mean? It's a fancy word. A man I worked with <clears throat> went through this process and forgave his father for molesting his daughters. The grandfather had molested his granddaughters. When this man found out about it, obviously very hurt, devastated, went through this process, came to the other side, was able to release this terrible burden. But he turned them over to the authorities and represented the case in the courts. And his father at age 67 went to prison for six years. He still loves his father. He meets with his father on a regular basis, but his father is not allowed in their house or to visit with the granddaughters. He wasn't going to not address it because he wanted his daughters to know what grandpa did was not right and there were consequences. He didn't surrender justice, but he went through a process of releasing his father and forgiving his father and loving his father. Then you've heard stories similar to that, normally connected to some type of prison or trauma or death or accident. It's possible. But forgiveness is not a retaliation or exacting revenge or seeking compensation or judging. Again, I've said what forgiveness is not. What is it? It's a decision to release, to release them. That's why I like the image of the, of the hand opening up. It's a process. It's not easy. It's a process. It takes time. It doesn't happen like an event. And the process, once we decide and go through the process of releasing them, paradoxically, we are released. And then we realize that we are released. Those are three different phrases that describe three different phases of the freedom process. I decide to release them. I can't do that without prayer. I can't do that without companionship and support and experienced guidance. And then I find out that I have been released because I decided to take action to release them. And I'm very aware of the grace that's involved. I can't get here from there, and yet here I am. Forgiveness is a process of change. Well, it began in step four as I see it. I'm very clear now as I look back over my shoulder at my resentment inventory where I looked at the third column and saw my dysfunctional delusional beliefs. Those words are not in the big book, but that was my experience in that third column of the resentment inventory that's listed on page 65. Not that there's particular instructions or definitions in the big book. There aren't. There's just a list of words. That's why it's so important to have a connection to a step guide and or sponsor that has information broader than what's in the big book based on their own personal experience or the experience of other people. 
column three allowed me to see my beliefs, the shoulds in my life that were completely delusional. And column four, I call column four the second paragraph on page 67 that describes the final instructions on how to handle the resentment inventory. Five questions concerning my self-centeredness for ease of communication I use the term fourth column that those words are not in the big book about columns although there is a three column inventory on page 65 even there the words are not used but the image is there but there's no definition of the words or how to apply them that's where experience direction was so necessary but in the fourth column for the very first time I took full responsibility for my behavior I am not responsible for people and events and how they impact me no 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 here please hear this this is a critical not subtle distinction I am not responsible for events or people and how they impact me I am responsible for my reaction to the impact on me. That's a dramatic difference. A tidal wave comes and it washes over me and it knocks me down. I'm not responsible for the tidal wave nor being knocked down. I might be responsible for being in the approach of a tidal wave. I certainly am responsible for my reaction to the tidal wave. A blessing of the serenity prayer. What can I influence? What can't I influence? Wisdom is the product of making mistakes because of misinterpretation, correcting the mistakes and learning from the mistakes, seeing the difference that I am not a mistake because I make mistakes. I just make mistakes. And then I make an effort to learn from them either on my own or from other people's experience. And as the result of course correction, that 10 step is the tool of emotional sobriety for course correction, I develop wisdom. I have a new attitude toward reality. It just is. Reality just is what it is. Emotional sobriety means I don't take it personally. Reality is just what it is. And I need to deal with it as it is. Reality doesn't give one hoot about what I want, what I feel, and what I need. That tidal wave will just suffocate me. Because that's the nature of a tidal wave. People and institutions are pretty much the same. The key is to accept reality as it is, but as the serenity prayer says, change what I can. Change what I can, but accept reality as it is. This is crucial to forgiveness. Reality just is, it's not personal, and I need to accept most of our stories are all about navigating a should. We have a story. We don't know we have a story, but we're living the story to the best of our ability. But the script was written by us or somebody else, and it's wrong. And we need to write a new script. Steps four through nine is the reframing and the rewriting of the script to be more in alignment i love the word alignment with reality so that our actions are then functional and effective if i'm not getting the outcome that i want i need to change my actions in order to change my actions i might need to get some new information or change my attitude that's where direction comes in the serenity prayer excuse me the the set-aside prayer is phenomenally effective, not because it changes anything outside of me, 
but because it changes me. An open mind and an open heart allows me to accept direction. In fact, seek and accept direction from other people who have knowledge. The four men who took me through the steps didn't become my friend. The four men who took me through the steps were not my pro uh, sponsors. The four men who took me through the steps were like project managers. We had a beginning and we had an end. I was very grateful for the process, but I didn't continue the relationship for a variety of reasons. It's not important. I wanted freedom from my addiction on a permanent basis. I was able to get that and to ensure that by doing the first nine steps. But I wanted freedom from unmanageability on a daily basis. The big book is quite clear. At the end of the ninth step, it says we have a, we're not cured, we have a daily reprieve. We're not cured. Not cured of what? not cured of our unmanageability, not cured of our self-centeredness, not cured of our humanity. Please hear that. Unmanageability as illustrated on page 52 in the big book with those bedevilments, that behavioral description of unmanageability. Behavioral, this is what it looks like. Unmanageability, the spiritual malady, as described in pages 60 to 62, the underlying cause of those bedevilments is my self-centeredness. And Bill ends that description on page 62 at the end of that second paragraph, said, and we can't even reduce it much by wishing or trying on our own power. Oh, man, the anvil drops, the hammer drops. Sure, I'm powerless over my addiction. Most everybody really accepts that in some form or another. And many people even understand it from their own experience in terms of the analysis of the, of the science and the experience. A body problem like an allergy that produces craving and an obsession of the mind over which we're powerless an insanity, meaning unhealthy thinking, and we need protection. We need a spiritual shield. These are my terms now. A spiritual shield that is given to us by the end of the ninth step. Step nine is about action. Finishing the ninth step. How free? How soon? Finishing the ninth step. People who talk about never being able to finish the ninth step are uninformed or inexperienced. Uninformed or inexperienced. I have finished the ninth step four different times that I've gone through the work. Not repeating the amends for harm done, but identifying new situations that needed to be addressed. And of course, the lists got shorter. How do you make amends to dead people? I went to the cemetery, wrote the letter there and read the letter out loud and got free. I was sitting on the top of a mountain in New Mexico on a retreat, doing some inventory work, preparing my eight step, realizing that there were three people dead that I needed to make amends to as soon as I got back to Los Angeles. I returned to the camp and on the way back to the camp on the side of the path, I spotted a, a light, a, sort of a glinting, flashing light. It was odd. It was the desert. What, what's, and I went off the desert trail, making sure I was safe. 
and 20, 20 yards off of the trail, there's three graves. I didn't have to wait till I got to Los Angeles. I was able to make my three amends at the three graves right there. I mean, these are the kinds of mysterious coincidences that happen when you're truly involved with making amends. How do you make amends to people that you shouldn't find or you can't find? Those are two different categories. People you shouldn't find because it would disrupt their lives. People that you can't find legitimately because you didn't even know their names. I created a prayer practice. It's not in the big book, but in my meditation, which I had an effective meditation practice beginning at that time, I got direction. Create a prayer practice for the people that you can't find or shouldn't find. Maybe it's a light touch amen, three days of prayer. Maybe it's a little heavier duty, three weeks of prayer. Maybe it's more heavy duty and substantial. Maybe three months of prayer. Prayer specifically for that person's healing. If I ever meet these people or have the opportunity to address it directly or indirectly, I'm willing to do that. Meanwhile, I've created a spiritual practice of forgiveness and of healing and of repair that brings me to a conclusion. It's not vague. It's not out there. Oh, sometime or maybe I'll, I'll do some living amends. I, I do believe in living amends, but not as a substitute for actual amends. Living amends, from my standpoint, means living changed. A very small example would be, <clears throat> my wife was an early to bed person, <clears throat> and I'm not. And I know that she really liked to have a clean kitchen in the morning. And sometimes before she went to bed, she was just too tired to take care of whatever she wanted or needed to take care of. And I would make sure that the kitchen was clean when she woke up. I never told her I was doing that. I never looked for feedback. I never suggested it or hinted at it. But this was all part of my ninth step approach in 1988-89 when I was doing this work for the very first time. About three years later, she was cooking breakfast one morning. And she said, oh, by the way, I really appreciate your cleaning up the kitchen. I mean, she wasn't going to give me too much recognition too early. But that's what I mean by living amends, living changed, living as a citizen of the community, living as a citizen of the world, being responsible. As I said, I, I talked about hmm, step nine last time. This time I'm talking about it from the forgiveness standpoint, from my experience with the 12 step process. Next week, I'll be talking about forgiveness uh, from the psychological process, giving a summary of uh, Dr. Luskin's and then comparing it to the uh, big book process, <clears throat> just so that you see the confirmation between science and spirituality. It's very parallel. The words are different, but the process is the same. If you have a chance, it would be wonderful for you to read the meditation I have in the Way of Life document. We may have already distributed it to, I'm not sure exactly what we do sometimes. Um, but in the uh, Way of Life document, there's also a comparison that Dan Sherman did. Dan was just a wonderful 12-step big book thumper and a fundamentalist and literalist like myself. He wrote his own guide to the big book called uh, Big Book Awakening. And in that, uh, he has a comparison between the bedevilments and the promises. Uh, he's given, he died about four years ago, but he gave me permission to use it uh, in my material. And I, I use it with giving him credit for it. But uh, it's a wonderful insight. Page 52 is a description of the bedevilments. Pages 83 and 84 is a description of the promises. And there's a parallel that he made of 
those bedevilments being completely turned inside out into promises as the result of the completion of steps four through nine. And I'll we'll look at that next week. Maybe if you wanted to anticipate that, you could take a look at it. I suggest that you look not only look at it, but you take it into a meditation in terms of the gratitude for the process, but also read it out loud across the bedevilment and the promise, the bedevilment and the promise. It's eerie. It's really eerie. I hope Bill was actually conscious of it as he wrote it, um, but I have no way of knowing that. The word I use, it's not used very much uh, in the big book, at least in this area, is healing. Steps four through nine brings healing, brings healing to me. Step nine brings healing to them, which brings healing to me. And I call that healing the forgiveness. But if you want to get really, 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 really simple, freedom is the word. The big book promises, and it's very clear, freedom from addiction. Well, it's about alcohol, of course, but we're expanding it because everybody's invited. Any 12-step person in any 12-step fellowship is invited to these workshops, as I do with my own workshops. <clears throat> Bill Wilson said in the preface to the first edition, if you haven't looked at that first paragraph, first paragraph, preface to the first edition, April 1939, it's in your big book. Right at the beginning, the first preface, the first paragraph. At the end of that first paragraph, he said, our way of living may have its advantages for all. And I don't mean, I don't think he means in the book, all alcoholics. I don't even think he had in his mind all addicts. That wasn't a concept that he had. He, he couldn't have anticipated that this 12-step work would proliferate in the many different 12-step fellowships, over 100 or 200 different fellowships. Like he, he didn't have that in his consciousness. He was actually surprised and pleased to see it develop into Al-Anon in 1951. But that was a surprise to him. So it's even a bigger prophetic statement that he made. Prophetic, I'm using the word very carefully. Our way of living may have its advantages for all because he saw that this work is not just alcoholics. This work is not just addicts. This work is for human beings. Unmanageability is the human condition. And this work is the antidote to unmanageability. This work is the antidote to the bedevilments. This work is the antidote to the uh, cancer of the soul. These are words that he uses concerning the bedevilments and that self-centeredness. He, he confirms that on page 76 where he says, willing to go to any length to have uh, a freedom from, uh, well, let me quote it, let me not just... Remember, it was agreed at the beginning we would go to any lengths for victory over alcohol, dealing with our addiction, first half of the first step. And then, of course, on page 79, he uses almost the same words, but with a different ending. Reminding ourselves that we have decided to go to any lengths to find a spiritual experience. The antidote to unmanageability. Freedom. Freedom from our addiction. Freedom, freedom from our unmanageability. Freedom ad from addiction is what happens at the end of the ninth step. A state of neutrality. But then he's very clear and careful to say that our freedom on a daily basis is based on our practice on a daily basis. These promises will always manifest, he says, 
If we work for them, this brings us to step 10. This brings us to step 11. This brings us to step 12. He calls those three steps our way of living. Those are the steps of emotional sobriety. Those are the steps of living free. Those are the steps of full empowerment. God does not manage my life. That's not the point here, as I understand it. The point here is that I manage my life. I manage my life. In the light of the principles of reality and the power that is reality. I have an effective relationship with power and therefore I am empowered to manage my life. I'm a human being. I slip off the slope in the 10th step and I become disturbed and I course correct. I'm a human being at night. I didn't course correct during the day and I course correct tonight or tomorrow. And in the morning, I ask for guidance and power. Listen to step 11. Praying for knowledge and the power to implement it. And step 12 is about staying and sustaining our awakeness through the application of principles and the consciousness of helping other people. Bill says it so clearly. We keep our head in the clouds and our feet on the ground. That vertical relationship with the spirit and that horizontal relationship with people. This is our way of life. Happy, joyous, and free. Happy, joyous, and free. Thanks, everybody.